Well, welcome everyone to a session of uh, sign out with the professor. Um, I'm glad you could join us. And um, today we're going to be talking uh, again about a number of uh, very interesting gynecologic specimens. Hope to give you uh, kind of a feel for how I approach a, a slide. Uh, I know focus has uh, been a problem in the, ch in the past, so I've tried to address that. I may use a couple of digital slides to help overcome that as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen uh, so that we can uh, begin to, to look at things. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of the uh, uh, histories and uh, let you uh, consider uh, what you might do with that history. Um, so our first case uh, is a 32-year-old uh, woman who presents uh, with a um, what appears to be a cystic lesion in one ovary. Uh, several centimeters in size. Um, she doesn't have any other specific uh, symptoms, and this was sort of discovered incidentally. So uh, coming to low magnification here, um, a couple of things become evident. Um, we can see that there is a, uh, a nice cuff of normal uh, ovarian tissue, uh, and then this uh, central uh, tissue that is uh, quite eosinophilic. It has uh, a degree of uh, lobularity, um, it has some hypocellular areas, um, and uh, some more cellular areas. Uh, it has uh, thin walled blood vessels, uh, somewhat ectatic, but not very much. And then maybe a little bit of uh, angiomatous uh, type of appearance in some areas. Uh, looking at this other section here, we again see uh, the boundary between the normal uh, ovarian tissue um, here at the top and uh, our uh, neoplasm. So we'll go and take a look at the neoplasm here um, as we uh, see. Mm. Uh, here, it's not particularly a spindle cell uh, neoplasm. Uh, there's a, a degree of uh, polygonal nature to some of these uh, cells. Uh, they don't uh, seem to have uh, maybe a little bit of a stellate appearance, but not very, uh, very striking. Um, higher magnification, we see there's really no atypia here. Um, and we don't see any epithelial uh, orientation or differentiation um, in this area, in this tumor uh, as well. Uh, and here we can see a little bit better uh, some of these uh, uh, small blood vessels, slit-like spaces, uh, a sort of a degree of vascularity that maybe is a little bit uh, uh, striking. So, um, this is an example of uh, uh, what is uh, called the sclerosing stromal tumor. Uh, if you've been following my uh, uh, videos, you may have seen this case presented. Um, but we note the uh, areas of, uh, of hypocellularity here alternating with hypercellularity. Apologize for that uh, uh, lighting issue with the uh, arrow there. I'll be a little bit more careful with that. Um, and uh, is characterized by a, uh, a somewhat vascularized uh, appearance, some stromal markers, uh, typically uh, calretinin or MART1, um, and a very banal appearance. Now, why is this not a uh, fibroma or a fibrothecoma? Um, and that is because, uh, first of all, it's not uh, spindle-shaped spindle -shaped cells. Uh, it has these uh, hypocellular areas, which in this case are sort of eosinophilic rather than clear, but oftentimes they can be very cleared out. Um, and it has a very banal, bland appearance uh, with the stromal uh, uh, characteristics on uh, uh, immunostaining. It's an uncommon tumor and uh, not one that requires any special management. So we'll go to our next case, uh, and this is a 48-year-old uh, woman, and uh, she had a uh, history of um, uh, a long-standing history of uh, atrophic chronic gastritis. Uh, 
and so here's a picture of her native stomach. Um, and as you can see, this does not look like a normal fundus, uh, and this is taken from the fundus. Uh, but instead, we have sort of uh, antral metaplasia. We have chronic inflammation with uh, eosinophils and so forth. Um, and we have more pyloric type glands rather than uh, 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 fundic or uh, uh, other type of glands. And then as we go along, we see here also uh, that we have uh, fairly striking uh, intestinal metaplasia uh, with lots of goblet cells. So this is the backdrop we see uh, going along. Uh, even as we uh, progress in this uh, lesion, well, let's see if we get. We almost get to the point where the uh, uh, tumor has almost a duodenal type of appearance. Um, we'll look at this other uh, pattern here. So this is still a uh, fundus uh, of the uh, stomach, and you can see here this very uh, duodenal-like uh, appearance to the uh, architecture uh, with villus uh, structures. Now, of course, uh, they didn't take this out because she has atrophic chronic gastritis. They took it out because uh, this lesion led to a uh, uh, neoplasm. Uh, and here we can see uh, the gastric neoplasm. Not a difficult uh, diagnosis to recognize this as an adenocarcinoma. Um, but this case illustrates one of the challenges with gastric carcinomas. And that is, uh, how does one classify it? So um, here we see the baseline stomach. Here we see almost a uh, tubular adenoma or more intestinal type of uh, epithelium uh, with elongated fronds and villus type architecture. Um, then we come into another intestinal variant, more of a mucinous carcinoma. And we can see, you know, dissecting pools of mucin with um, little bits of uh, tumor cells in them, uh, in, the, in the pools of mucin. We can also see here uh, that we have a very uh, diffuse pattern here in this area uh, where the cells become very poorly differentiated and they're associated with a very dense um, inflammatory infiltrate uh, with uh, uh, lots of lymphocytes. So seeing this uh, type of an area would raise consideration for uh, possibly even an EBV-associated gastric carcinoma, uh, so-called lymphoepithelial type of uh, tumor. Um, and uh, so we did testing for uh, EBV using the uh, in situ hybridization technique, um, and that was uh, negative. Uh, so uh, the other, oh, the other uh, morphology that I wanted to illustrate was this uh, particular morphology, which looks more like a tubular type of adenocarcinoma. And so you have a mixture of mucinous, intestinal, tubular, um, and even uh, diffuse type um, uh, with the prominent lymphoid stroma uh, that uh, come into play here. And just illustrates one of the challenges in classifications of uh, gastric uh, carcinomas. And I think that's <clears throat> further illustrated by the fact that uh, the CAP checklist uh, allows you to, do, to use either the Lawrenson or the WHO uh, technique uh, classification system to classify these tumors. Um, now, uh, fortunately, uh, this uh, had not completely invaded the wall. We see that although there's a lymphoid reaction here uh, outside the wall, uh, the tumor had not uh, fully penetrated. Um, however, uh, the patient did have nodal metastases and unfortunately uh, passed away from a postoperative uh, complication. Uh, um. All right, well, let's go on to the next case. Um, <clears throat> this is a 22 year old woman who uh, has had, uh, who is pregnant and has had some abnormal bleeding uh, during pregnancy. And uh, they thought that she had uh, uh, either a missed abortion or was having some other uh, particular type of problem uh, with the pregnancy. And the ultrasound uh, did not uh, particularly uh, disclose ep evidence of a fetus. Uh, there was no heart tones, uh, even at uh, 10 weeks. Um, 
or tw excuse me, at 12 weeks. Uh, and uh, she also uh, was noted to have a very markedly elevated HCG beyond what would be expected for dates. So there was uh, considerable uh, concern for possible uh, molar pregnancy um, and an evacuation was performed. Now, as we can see here, uh, there are some rather large uh, villi uh, and they're quite empty in the middle. Uh, in other words, they're, they're edematous. Um, and so uh, uh, looking at this uh, lesion under the microscope, we would think this certainly could be a uh, uh, gestational neoplasia. Uh, particularly uh, as we look at this, we see there's also a large amount of uh, accompanying uh, trophoblastic proliferation. Uh, there is some scalloping to these uh, villi. Uh, in other words, they have little uh, indentations, uh, as you can see here, uh, into the lumen. Uh, we don't see uh, particularly well-developed vessels uh, in this, so uh, uh, the lack of a fetus on ultrasound and the uh, lack of uh, functional vessels here uh, so here's maybe uh, something that we might think of as a possible vessel right there. I don't know if you can see the arrow there. Um, a little suggestion of the, those possibly being vessels, but not uh, definitely. Uh, and so uh, this was a, a, a differential where we would say, well, is this uh, truly a, you know, a, a molar pregnancy? Uh, and given the degree of uh, proliferation here, um, probably under most conventional circumstances, one wouldn't have difficulty in classifying this uh, as a, a molar pregnancy based on that. Uh, however, we did also go forward and do uh, P57 staining. Um, and uh, again, these, this is a principle I've tried to illustrate with a number of recent uh, videos. Um, here we can see the uh, internal control uh, in the decidual and trophoblastic cells, uh, but absence in the uh, villus stroma, absence in the uh, cytotrophoblast lining the villus. Um, and so uh, this is a, a wonderful example of a uh, complete molar pregnancy uh, with uh, absent P57 staining um, as illustrated here. We'll go on to uh, another case here. Um, this is a 46-year-old uh, female who has uh, had uh, some abnormal uh, uh, vaginal discharge um, and uh, is found to have a uh, rather bulky intraluminal mass, um, and that is uh, resected. Uh, first with a polypectomy and then subsequently with a hysterectomy. So here we see the low magnification view of this lesion. Uh, we can see that there are some central vessels, uh, as you can see. And then we have a, a glandular uh, pattern with sort of um, uh, some slit-like and slightly leaf-like uh, patterns. Um, with an apparent uh, degree of condensation uh, around some of these uh, uh, areas. So um, this uh, raises the differential consideration of, a, of the biphasic tumor um, that we would see. Uh, in the uterus. And of course, uh, the primary differential we would be considering here is uh, uh, adenomyoma or uh, adenosarcoma uh, or uh, adenomyomatous polyp with uh, sarcomatous like change. Uh, we don't have the atypia that goes along with. Um, uh, mixed Mullerian carcinosarcoma type of lesion. So typically in an adenosarcoma, one gets uh, sort of leaf-like or phylloides-like growth pattern. And we see a little bit of that here. 
uh, as you can see, this sort of arched uh, area of, uh, of tumor um, and a very bland epithelial cell component. Uh, we don't see uh, much in the way of uh, epithelial atypia in any of this uh, tissue. Um, now, if it's going to be just an adenomyoma, we would expect it to be more endometrial type stroma rather than um, uh, uh, proliferative sarcomatous type of stroma. So looking at the uh, stromal component here is quite uh, important. Um, and uh, as we can see, there's a degree of uh, atypia here um, in these cells. Uh, these are not the usual small condensed uh, stromal cells of an endometrial type stroma. And we do have uh, a few mitoses here, um, as you can see right there. Um, and uh, so uh, this begins to look more like uh, the possibility of an adenosarcoma uh, based on uh, this uh, proliferative finding. Um, and I think this case is an important one to consider because this pattern is not uh, the classic uh, stromal overgrowth uh, type of pattern we would usually see with adenosarcoma. Uh, but the finding of uh, the condensed solid and now pro and proliferating atypical stroma uh, without the uh, frond-like architecture typically seen uh, still can allow you to make this diagnosis. Now, the other bimorphic tumors or biphasic tumors that you would consider uh, would be thing li things like uh, atypical polypoid adenomyoma. Uh, that does not have this uh, proliferative type stroma, but rather has a uh, myomatous uh, stroma directly abutting the glands, uh, which uh, again can be somewhat irregular in shape. Um, so this is a low-grade neoplasm. Uh, but can be invasive into the uh, myometrium. Uh, and in this case, this patient did have some myometrial invasion of this lesion uh, to about 50% of the uh, wall. Um, the major uh, risk with this lesion is uh, local recurrence uh, or regional recurrence if it is spread beyond the uh, uh, uterus. And because these tumors often are hormonally responsive, um, hysterectomy with oophorectomy is uh, typically the uh, treatment of choice as opposed to just simple hysterectomy for, uh, say, a Mazur's polyp or something of that sort. So um, there we have a, a case of a somewhat uh, unusual pattern for adenosarcoma uh, with uh, these uh, very elongate uh, glandular structures rather than the leaf like uh, infoldings that are more characteristic. I think you can begin to see that there's some uh, 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 commencement of that uh, leaf-like architecture here, but it's certainly far from uh, typically developed uh, to make the diagnosis uh, easier or obvious uh, at low magnification. Okay, well, let's move on to another case with just kind of a, a two-for-one case. Uh, this is... Um, a patient who is a 40-year-old woman, and she has uh, peritoneal uh, disseminated disease. Um, and this, of course, is a, a very uh, proliferative epithelial uh, type tumor. We can see lots of epithelial structures um, and uh, abundant uh, exuberant growth. Uh, the differential here in a situation like this, uh, given her age, would be uh, largely between a low-grade um, neoplasm, uh, a low-grade serous tumor, and a high-grade serous tumor. Um, and uh, there's a, that would be a little bit difficult on pure morphology. Perhaps in the olden days, this might have landed in the intermediate category. Uh, now, of course, using a two-tier classification system, we primarily base, make this decision based on P53 immunochemistry and look for the uh, loss or the mutation uh, in the lesion. Uh, this case was mutated and therefore uh, 
uh, fit best into the uh, high grade serous carcinoma category. Um, and I think you can see here the very uh, characteristic slit like spaces of a serous papillary neoplasm. Um, and we'll contrast this uh, case uh, with the, the next case we'll show you uh, to uh, just highlight uh, some of the difference between high and low grade. Uh, but this case uh, came with his hysterectomy, uh, which also appeared to have an unusual tumor in the wall uh, of the uterus. Um, and the question was raised, is this uh, invasive uh, neoplasia from the, uh, from the ovary? Um, here we can see the low magnification view uh, of this lesion. And uh, as you can see, there's a, a very uh, sieve-like pattern to this neoplasm. Lots of open spaces, uh, scattered random sizes, and so forth. Um, and we'll go to higher magnification on this uh, fairly quickly, just so you get the feel uh, for what's going on here. We see this sort of um, racemos or uh, spindling, uh, streaming pattern of cells um, in this neoplasm with these variable size uh, open spaces. Um, not much in the way of epithelium here, uh, at least at first glance, uh, and even on higher magnification, you know, picking out what is epithelial versus what is stromal is uh, maybe a little bit difficult. Could this be a vascular lesion and so forth? Well, uh, here's a maybe a little bit more epithelial type of an appearance in some of those spaces. Of course, in a situation like this, we, we set, suspect that this is probably uh, an adenomatoid tumor, uh, given the location and this appearance. Uh, but I thought it was a nice, uh, nice bulky one, first of all, uh, to see this size of a lesion. Um, this is the immunohistochemistry, which removes any doubt. Uh, and we can see here it nicely stains with um, the uh, markers of pankeratin and calretinin uh, in this tumor in a very beautiful pattern, uh, confirming that diagnosis uh, of adenomatoid tumor. So an inc incidentally discovered but quite uh, elegant uh, lesion uh, to consider. Now, I promised you a, a, different, a different serous tumor. Here it is. Uh, this is in a 36-year-old, so only a few years younger than our 40-year-old that we just looked at. Um, and uh, again, uh, disseminated peritoneal disease. And here is the uh, biopsy of the omentum, uh, which shows this uh, quite cellular tumor um, with variable um, luminal type spaces and some slit-like pattern growth in a few areas. Here we can see some of that. So we'll take a look at higher magnification. And I think uh, perhaps from this you can appreciate um, that this is just subtly lower grade nuclei uh, compared to that previous case. The nuclei are just a tad bit smaller. Uh, they're less uh, uh, open in terms of a chromatin pattern. Uh, there are few, if any, uh, uh, nucleoli. Come into focus here. You know, there's a few small ones here, uh, but they're not the, quite the same coarse uh, type that we had with the other lesion. So uh, again, we would certainly uh, want to make sure that this is a low-grade neoplasm, low-grade serous tumor. Uh, but if we uh, uh, were able to do the immunochemistry, uh, that might help us. So, so let's take a look here. Um, so uh, we did a couple of things with this. Uh, uh, certainly looking at a negative stain, here's the positive control. Uh, and here we can see our uh, P16, or excuse me, our P53 stain. And we'll come into higher magnification so we can pick out that uh, there is a, some internal staining. Uh, we do have a few of the tumor cells that are picking up the stain. Uh, 
Uh, so we can uh, rule out that this is a null type mutation. This is a wild type expression of p53. Uh, now of note, uh, this lesion did express um, p16, uh, but in a an altered pattern. So this also was supportive of of the diagnosis of low grade serous tumor. High-grade serous tumors, both in the uh, uterus as well as in the uh, ovary, tend to have very strong blocky expression of p16. This is not because of uh, integration of uh, HPV, uh, but due to uh, uh, other mutational events uh, activating that uh, marker. Um, we also did on this particular case um, to further confirm its uh, serous uh, nature we did a uh, WT1 stain, which you can see here also is strongly positive. Uh, and that helps to exclude uh, you know, mesotheliomas or other uh, tumors, uh, non-ovarian, non-mullerian derived uh, that might come into the differential in this case. Uh, for contrast, well, let's, let's go on here for that. Leave that one out. Um, so sort of staying with the GYN theme, uh, here is a very interesting case uh, that is the uh, topic of a uh, <clears throat> soon to be released video. Um, and uh, this is a patient um, who, who is uh, I think uh, 48 um, and she has uh, a hysterectomy for an endometrial polyp and this is what the polyp uh, looks like. So here's the surface, sort of uh, necrotic appearing. And as we see, uh, the stroma underneath here is a little bit more condensed. Um, and then we have this higher cellularity area here, uh, which also appears to be a purely stromal uh, type of uh, tissue. So this is uh, the polyp. Uh, again, we'll go to low power. You can see she was bleeding, um, and we have a fairly cellular uh, polyp. Uh, I showed you the tip of the polyp. This is the base of the polyp. Uh, so here we see a little bit of uh, endometrium remaining here. Um, and this polyp uh, sort of extending down to about the level of the uh, endometrium here. Um, looking at this under higher magnification, um, we'll take a look at uh, what we see here. We can see that it's a, a fairly uh, bland lesion, fairly uniform. Uh, spindle type cells maybe, or slightly uh, stromal type cells. Not much cytoplasm. A uh, very delicate background of vasculature. Uh, and not a lot of mitotic activity in this. So going even here to higher magnification, uh, I don't see any evidence of uh, mitotic figures uh, in this lesion. It is uh, fairly bland in that regard and mon monotonous. So, um, so this is obviously then a stromal neoplasm. It was CD10 positive, which I can show you here. Um, uh, here is the CD10. Uh, so you can see that this most cellular area was strongly positive. Uh, and then this less cellular area here has, is also positive. Um, but maybe to a lesser degree. So uh, differential expression of the uh, CD10 in this lesion uh, for whatever reason. Um, we also did uh, hormone receptors on this uh, lesion. And as you can see, um, it, uh, come into focus here. You can see that it expresses uh, uh, some degree of estrogen receptor in the nucleus of these cells. So um, this patient had a uh, hysterectomy uh, 
but her ovaries were left behind. So this lesion was uh, classified as a uh, stromal nodule, um, which was, I think, the correct diagnosis. Um, and it was uh, resected, uh, but they neglected to take out the ovaries. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, that may have uh, been uh, uh, chosen due to you know patient preference or patient other patient issues, but now three years later, uh, the patient has uh, developed some hydronephrosis and has a, a large pelvic mass um, that uh, is then biopsied. So needle core biopsies uh, come to us. Um, as I look at this, I can see uh, here on the tip of this. Uh, fragment in the center, there's a little bit of hemosiderin. Uh, we've got some uh, simple vascular structures. Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of uh, fibrous tissue. Um, and then we have little fragments that look like this. A little bit different from the other tissue, more vascularized, and, uh, but fairly low grade appearing. So here's uh, some benign tissue, and then here's some of this, and here's a fragment that looks like this. So I was unaware of the history when I first looked at this, and I thought, well, maybe this is endometriosis, or maybe this is some other sort of uh, benign process. Um, but in looking at this, I thought, well, maybe this could be something uh, when the surgeon came down and said, well, did you know that she'd had this hysterectomy for such and such? Well, let's look at the prior case, and so we did, and uh, uh, the uh, history or the appearance was quite remarkable. Um, we did then a CD10 stain, um, and here's the low magnification view, and as you can see, there are striking areas of this that uh, stain nicely positively, um, as our prior uh, lesion did, and so we made the diagnosis of uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma, low grade, uh, probably uh, arising or related to that endometrial stromal nodule uh, that had occurred in her initial uh, sample. So, is this uh, uh, rare? Is this unusual? Well, these are are similar. These are sort of two ends of the spectrum. One is very localized disease. One is more disseminated disease. Um, and it's uh, physio physiochemically, but histogenetically, the same type of lesion um, that uh, is involved here. Uh, if we think of uh, would have, could have, should have uh, sort of thing, had they removed the patient's ovaries, uh, perhaps uh, the uh, hormonal drive for this uh, lesion to proliferate or recur uh, perhaps would have been removed. She did have a history of endometriosis, and so this could have been a synchronous development in endometriosis or something of that sort that then was uh, driven uh, by the presence of ongoing hormonal stimulation. So sort of a sad outcome there because she's not an operable uh, candidate at this point. All right, uh, well, let me, let's go on to one more case here. We have a few more minutes. Um, this is a 17-year-old female who has a uh, um, uh, gonadal dysgenesis uh, syndrome. And uh, this is a nice example of uh, what uh, happens in many of these patients. Uh, so this is sort of a streak gonad. It's not a fully developed uh, ovary. Um, and we can see that uh, there's calcification. Very often these uh, lesions uh, are identified on ultrasound with this sort of snowy appearance. Um, and we see a, a distinctive pattern uh, in this ovary of, uh, we see a distinctive pattern in this ovary of uh, uh, tubular structures uh, with uh, a secondary uh, type of uh, lesion going on here as well. So here, uh, if we look at this area right here, you know, in some circumstances, this type of a pattern, we might think of a call exner bodies, 
or we might think of a scatat, a sex core tumor with annular tubules. Um, and that is, a, is kind of reminiscent of what's going on here. But we also have a secondary population of cells, which I think you can appreciate at this magnification, that have somewhat cleared cytoplasm, quite large nuclei, and are sort of displacing or pushing aside these tubules. So take a look here a little bit more closely. Um, and I think here you can see this dual population. So if you look at these closely at these tubules, they're lined by a fairly small uh, uniform uh, type cell, maybe more of a granulosal-like cell uh, or what you'd see in a scatat. Uh, and then we have these other uh, tumors here, or the, these other cells here that have uh, larger nuclei, clear cytoplasm, they're poorly cohesive, um, and they're sort of filling and expanding these tubules uh, and pushing aside the smaller hyalinized tubules. So this image of uh, this type of a process ought to be reminiscent of a germ cell neoplasm, sort of a dysgerminoma-like uh, uh, lesion, uh, displacing these uh, sex cord uh, annular tubular-like lesions. And we can get the variable reaction in this situation. Here's the giant cell reaction. Um, and then we also get the uh, process that we saw with the calcification um, that happens. Uh, here's, here's some of that calcification, uh, which is the uh, um, end result of these uh, hyalinized tubular structures becoming uh, uh, avascular and uh, displaced. So this is a, uh, an example of uh, a gonadoblastoma um, in a patient with uh, a gonadal dysgenesis syndrome. Um, we can uh, demonstrate uh, some things about this. Here is the uh, HCG uh, in her uh, tumor. And as you can see, there's a lot of background staining. I don't think it's gonna stain particularly well. Um, but uh, what does highlight nicely the germ cell component of this is the uh, PLAP stain. Um, and here uh, we can see uh, how that uh, Oh, excuse me, this is the wrong, that's the wrong stain for this case. I'm sorry, no wonder it didn't look right. <laughs> so I've got the wrong stain there. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, go without that one. Um, what I do want to show uh, to sort of uh, conclude is uh, a related lesion. So this is, uh, um, <clears throat> again, a young patient who is uh, 35, no, no, I think 25, I believe. Um, and she has disseminated peritoneal disease um, and comes uh, for frozen section analysis. So here's a frozen section of an omental mass in a 25-year-old girl. Um, it's obviously showing lots of uh, um, frozen section artifact here. and. Um, not trying to teach you how to do frozen sections this morning, but I think you can see that this is quite cellular. And uh, these cells tend to be fairly large, um, have somewhat cleared or vacuous cytoplasm. And there's maybe a degree of, uh, of laciness to it, uh, maybe suggesting um, a, a poorly cohesive tumor. Um, so on a frozen section, the uh, diagnosis of this uh, would be likely germ cell tumor based on the uh, age of presentation, uh, but it could be other things like undifferentiated carcinomas. It could be you know, potentially even small cell carcinoma of, of hypercalcemic type. So essentially just telling them that this is a high grade uh, malignant, uh, possibly epithelial tumor or germ cell tumor gives them the differential to consider uh, as far as what to do next with this uh, lesion. So <clears throat> here's a nice example of the uh, permanent sections from this uh, lesion. Um, and we see here, then the, the diagnosis becomes a little bit, then the diagnosis becomes a little bit uh, easier to uh, uh, fathom as we look at this lesion. Uh, we see we've got some areas of necrosis, uh, we've got these uh, large cells. 
with uh, a fairly clear uh, cytoplasm, high-grade nuclei, uh, some disc keratosis, or excuse me, some disc, you know, apoptosis. Um, and as we look in a few areas like here, we can begin to see that there are some uh, stromal lymphocytes as well. So uh, looking at this morphology, uh, our first thought ought to be that this is a dysgerminoma. And then, of course, we'd want to exclude uh, there being other uh, features uh, uh, that would uh, mitigate against that. Um, immunohistochemistry uh, can be useful in this situation. CD117 can be very strongly positive in these tumors, as you see here. Uh, this is a section of the omental lesion. Um, uh, we also did uh, OCT34. Now, I show you this stain just to illustrate um, the variability in uh, what's positive and what's negative. Um, so this is a, uh, as you see, there's weak, pale staining of these cells. Uh, and this is a positive reaction. Um, so OCT34 is not a uh, knock you off your chair kind of positive staining like that CD117 uh, stain was. Uh, it's a fairly subtle stain that can uh, essentially just gives you a very weak blush to the cytoplasm uh, that is to be interpreted as positive. Um, it's helpful if you have a positive control on your, on your slide to compare, and here's the positive control uh, taken from a testis. Uh, and so you can see that here in this positive control area that the staining is also fairly weak um, and a, a kind of a pale blush to the cytoplasm. So this is the uh, value of uh, having uh, uh, controls on the same slide uh, that you are uh, going to be interpreting uh, because otherwise you might be inclined to, to call this stain negative or weak or non-contributory. Non so, <clears throat> well, uh, it's eight o'clock. I'll uh, just maybe go through, um, well, actually that's, that's all the cases I have for today. So I uh, appreciate you joining me and uh, we will uh, stop the share at this point. Um, I'm going to post these, uh, uh, cases, uh, or post our recording from today's uh, program uh, on the website. Uh, apologize if we uh, um, <clears throat> miscued on time or space for any of you. And I know some people tried to log in but had difficulty with sound. Um, so uh, again, thanks for joining me and we'll look forward to doing this again sometime. Uh, probably in April, it'll be uh, the third, third uh, Friday of, of April. So thank you again and uh, have a great time. Great day.